I mentioned in covering the best analyses of the election that the white working class was a real issue. And to me, one of the biggest issues that the Democrats eaten by neoliberalism basically ignored the white working class. And this is clearly a touchy issue, in particular, if we contrast this with what's becoming called identity politics. Uh, and there, there's a lot of interesting analysis being done on this. But I want to dive deeper into what the white working class has to look forward to. And this applies, I think, to people who've lost their jobs, as well as people with jobs who've got moderate to reasonable incomes, but they kind of see this tsunami coming. And uh, I think I'm, I'm trying to describe here the thing they see coming that nobody seems to be working to fix. So they, they see pretty bleak prospects. They see that their kids are going to do worse than they did. And they're accustomed to each generation doing better than the generation before. Jobs are gone and jobs were gone because corporations were highly motivated to outsource through globalization and Wall Street pressure. Uh, but also jobs are gone through automation. And I have to say, I see automation as a flesh-eating bacterium. Basically, uh, software, as soon as it's replicated a task as well as a human does it, uh, when the quality is as good, the cost is clearly a lot lower. Uh, so why not ship the job over to the uh, the piece of software? So people see that, but but and nobody's particularly designing software to augment rather than replace humans. Uh, so the question really is, when are you going to be wiped out? Uh, corporations in the meantime are busy eliminating full-time employees. They want to have as few people on the payroll who need benefits, who are who need an office, as is com, com, as is humanly possible. Uh, as a result, we have a lot of underemployment. The 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 juicy jobs are basically gone. We are, we're sitting in the middle of a jobless recovery, which is a a big topic and sort of beyond the scope of what I can do here, probably beyond the scope of what I understand. But it's real easy to blame this on immigrants and figure things out. Now, if you look a little deeper, uh, there's uh, some really interesting research into what the white working class has been feeling. And one of the things they feel, for example, about government uh, is that the funds never make it back here. We, basically, we, we get taxed by government, but nothing ever shows up to help us over here. Uh, in general, I think government support systems are cruel, in particular in the United States. In other countries, in the Northern European social democracies, the government support systems really are quite humanistic. Uh, and there's a whole ideological battle being fought between those systems, which was basically what Bernie Sanders was proposing, and uh, the American systems, which truly are cruel. They cut away support. They, uh, there, there seems to be the underpinning in America that unless the threat of imminent hunger and death are upon you, you won't try really hard to find a job. Uh, and what they don't understand is that poverty is a dismal trap, that the rags to riches stories apply to some small number who win the lotto, do the right thing at the right time, but that in general, poor people have no access to capital. In fact, their capital costs a lot. Uh, they ha and once they spiral downward, they, they just get trapped and keep spiraling downward. This is really a, a horrible setup in the US with very few people willing uh, to really pull people up. In fact, that has fallen on religious institutions and other third parties, nonprofits, who are busy trying to help a completely broken system. So government support systems are also very mechanistic, antiquated, and in many cases not dignified. The people who are on support uh, are played down as much, much inferior to other people in the, the, the popular narrative. So the white working class sees that all these things are broken. Politics is broken, community is broken, money is broken. There used to be things called blue chip stops, stocks. There used to be places where if you saved some money, you could put it somewhere. Now it just seems we're losing ground everywhere, unless you're really big. And if you're really big, you're gonna, your money is going to make money. But right now there's, there's no safe harbor. Uh, which particular category of asset do you know is actually going to be there when you retire? And they're getting priced out of housing. So even if they lived somewhere near their job, they can't afford that place anymore, rents are going up, etc. And they see that the 2008 global financial crisis almost wiped out a lot of things. In fact, it may have wiped out their retirement account if it wasn't already uh, expropriated basically by uh, takeover artists in the, in the, the 1990s or the 2000s. Then big box stores brought them cheap stuff. And in many cases, that was nice because now you could actually buy jeans and uh, sneakers for your kids at Christmas. But in so doing, it killed off the local small businesses. And then, and I think this is more dramatic than we realize, then the big box stores closed because as people didn't have jobs in rural towns or across the country, uh, they, they couldn't afford to buy things even in the big box stores. So traffic uh, went away and the Walmarts and others moved, other, moved, moved elsewhere. And as a result, we have a lot of ghost towns in the middle of the country. Uh, this is something that is mirrored in many places around the world, most notably maybe Japan, where many, many villages across Japan have seen all the young people move away. 
uh, there's an increasingly aging population, but you'll go into a village and you know 20% of the of the houses will actually be occupied. It's a little crazy. So what's the answer to all this? What do Democrats suggest? Retrain, go to school. Now, now retrain as what exactly? Uh, most of the schools are not really up to date. The degrees and the certifications and other things you can get don't really catch up with what's happening in the world today. Um, as they say, when you go into school, most of the things that are available as majors are not things that will be needed in the economy once you graduate. Never mind automation, right? Uh, tuition is expensive. It is uh, next to healthcare and, in fact, above healthcare, the fastest rising expense there. And because of the Bankruptcy Abuse Prevention and Consumer Protection Act passed under W, it is debt you cannot shake. The financial sector made sure that you couldn't bankrupt yourself from uh, school tuition. So you can throw Pell Grants at this. You can really try to move us toward community colleges. But I don't think that education works. But then automation makes this whole thing almost almost a joke because there is a lag effect mismatch, meaning the time it takes you to certify for something, to apply to school, get accepted, go take two years, three years, four years to get a degree, come back into the workforce and get a job, is very likely longer than the time it takes to automate some of the tasks of that thing you were about to try to become. Whether it's an x-ray tech or a dental tech or an auto mechanic or an aircraft mechanic, whatever that thing was that you thought you were going to train for, it may be gone. And, and it's very hard to figure out which one will be there and which one won't. So that system's supposed to work. And there's sort of nothing else. Nobody's in the neighborhood trying to help you figure this thing out. So that was all describing the situation for the working white class, the white working class, uh, whether employed or not employed, but just a, a typical situation and, and hopefully not too stereotypical. Um, for people of color, it's a bit different because they have all of that, um, except uh, they have a, a load on top, which is there are random uh, stoppings that occasionally result in deaths. And uh, well, there's been violence against people of color forever in the U.S. Uh, we can go back to Jim Crow and well before. Uh, but now many people are carrying high definition video cameras. So we're seeing more of these things and we're seeing just how random and stupid some of these things are. Uh, so you could be pulled over for a traffic citation and end up dead on the ground with nine bullets in your back. Uh, there's also the culture of mass incarceration, which uh, is the subject of a recent documentary called 13th about the 13th Amendment and how the plantation system was replaced by the incarceration system. That's still uh, in force. And unless we drop the, dr the, the war on drugs and do other sorts of things, that'll still keep going. Then there's many more subtle things like implicit bias. When people are interviewed for jobs, when people are looked at uh, as they come down the street, there's a whole series of biases that kick in, all of which add up to fewer opportunities for people of color. But part of the problem is we haven't dealt with the ghosts of our past. And I, I talked about this at some length in my first video, the, the precursor video. And I talked about the ghosts being things like slavery, things like how we treated our First Nations, things like misogyny. Uh, and, and these things really are still bubbling hot beneath the surface. And every time we try to deal with them, all hell breaks loose, as we can sort of see. Then um, women of color have an even worse uh, situation. So um, a factor on top of that, the misogyny and, and whatever else. And it's, it's just not a pretty picture. So everything I've just described, bleak as these prospects are, um, is before Trump's win. Before all of this, everything I just named was happening before Trump's win. Now factor in um, a considerable amount of shame. Now, 29% of the country seems to have voted for him uh, or something like that and uh, didn't include me. But I'm, I'm actually ashamed that Donald Trump is going to represent our country to other countries. And the kinds of things that he's going to do and has done are now represented as uh, okay for our leadership. Uh, but also Trump basically in hacking everybody and hijacking everybody, he, as a campaign strategy, he really let loose the hounds of hell. He has normalized and made uh, at least visible, certainly not appropriate, um, the kinds of actions that were formerly seen as purely fringe and that were edited out or were just left on the fringe. And these things are now uh, sort of everyday occurrences. Uh, there are violations of human, civil, women's rights, all sorts of things happening. And uh, there may well be more of it. So abuse and fear has been normalized and, in fact, fueled and fanned. 
Um, Godwin's law is that any online discor discourse off, uh, will tend to degrade into mentions of Hitler and the Nazis. Here, it's like <laughs> like Godwin's law has 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 become uh, the administration for the country. So it's it's a little very strange. Then facts are broken. We're now in this world of post-truth, which uh, was probably perking under the surface, but now has really become a way to deal with not having to um, face uncomfortable truths, including facts that you have spoken just a, a month earlier or a couple hours earlier. It's really quite amazing. So the anti-intellectualism that the GOP uh, did a very good job of bringing has now been amplified. Uh, doubts about science, uh, the inclusion of lobbyists in the government, uh, there could well be major problems with climate change in the next couple of years because even the measures we had agreed to take, uh, the Tokyo Proto Kyoto Protocols and other things, um, they're not enough and there's no guarantee whatsoever that those kinds of things would have helped. Now we're going to take our foot off the brake and in fact throw this thing into fifth gear uh, and see what that does. In the middle of this, uh, of all this, the Supreme Court is going to keep going. But then politically, you wonder whether uh, Brexit, now Trump, uh, whether there's a just a sharp swing to the right globally, a global lurch to the right, I'm calling it here, with Marine Le Pen, who might win, a, uh, win power in France, uh, Golden Dawn, Le Ganard, uh, the German AFD, in the Philippines, Duterte is the, the prime minister, uh, Poland, Hungary, Turkey, Austria, all have swung to the right in the last couple of years through elections, through dem democratic process. But there's nationalism, in fact, authoritarian nationalism that is uh, sort of all over the place. And uh, Putin in Russia is sort of happy to watch this and may well have ambitions of creating the greater Russia. Um, Trump himself is likely a very good recruiting poster for uh, the clash of civilizations, which uh, some of us were thinking we might actually be avoiding and maybe we're heading toward now. Uh, who knows? There, there could easily be on the table the potential for opening up World War III or at least triggering uh, regional or local nuclear wars. So this is all uh, not that exciting. Um, however, however, and this is, it's hard to talk about the howevers, but I'm looking for these places where uh, one could do something positive. Change really was needed. The reason all these things are happening, the reason for all this nationalism, is that we've been treated as mere consumers, not as human beings. We've been we've torn the fabric of society. We've decided to offload to government the support for people, and then we cut back the government. Um, we've been running this whole machine, country by country, on obsolete, if not backward, models of how things ought to work, on just these these concepts, these wars of memes and ideologies that really haven't worked out. Um, again, for me. Voting for Hillary meant putting on hold the kind of change that I saw could happen, and it was in fact already happening at a different kind of fringe, at a fringe like open source software, at a fringe like the sharing economy, uh, where people were learning how to trust one another again, in cities, in neighborhoods. So Trump has catalyzed a moment of dramatic change. Um, he also, in the process, left himself a lot of leeway. It's a little strange, but by backtracking on everything and denying everything he'd said before, he's kind of set a pattern where he can backtrack. Um, and uh, who knows where this all goes? So I found a small piece of humor on the, on the web. Trump says, hey, let's get that Muslim ban going. Ban? Uh, we thought you said ban. No way. That's harsh. Also, how, how's the Mexican mall coming? Uh, if only reality were like that. So I'm not trying to normalize or praise Trump. Uh, in fact, his first appointments are so off the charts abysmal that it's hard for me to complete these recordings. But I still want to keep the door open because I'm trying to find positive opportunities. And these opportunities uh, are worthwhile uh, in upcoming videos here. Uh, they're worthwhile whether or not Trump changes. There's a lot to be done. Um, if we don't do any of these things, this whole situation is really likely to end badly. And I mean quite badly. So I'm highly motivated from that to put these ideas out and see what we can do together. My name is Jerry Mikulski. This is one of a series of videos linked together around that Trump won and now what, we sh what should we do. Uh, I am not an historian or a political theorist and the rest of these bullets are explained in the lead video, the introductory video to this series. Uh, please subscribe and come back. There's more here. Thanks for watching.